For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Melanie Waxman. I've been in health and wellness for four decades now. Um, I've lived in four countries. I have seven kids. And for the past six years, I've been a specialist, a nutritional specialist at the Shah Wellness Clinic in Spain. Um, so today we're going to have a chat about weight. And this is a huge topic. Um, what we're going to do, Ginette and I are going to sort of go back and forth. She's going to ask a few questions just to, you know, make it a little bit more interesting rather than me rabbiting on. Um, but just before we start, this is very important. And I think we've all got to work on this. It's about judgment. In the world today, obesity is a, a huge issue. And people are very judging. They look at you when you come in, if you're overweight, if you come into a restaurant, they make comments, they, you know, uh, say things in their mind, or look at that person, obviously lazy, fat, whatever. That's very damaging to the person. It's very damaging. So we've got to work on stop judging others and also ourselves. If we have a weight issue, one of the worst things for weight, and it's going to take you backwards if you're trying to lose weight, is to judge yourself. Oh, I have a terrible body, or I hate myself. The idea of hating into love just doesn't work. So many people think, well, when I'm thin and a certain weight, an ideal weight, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be this perfect person, and I'm going to have a lovely relationship, and I'm going to have the best job ever, and I'm going to look great, and people are going to think I'm wonderful. It doesn't work like that. I'm sure if I asked you all a question and said, how many of you know people who are on the larger side who are really happy? Have a lovely family, wonderful kids, a great husband, you know, uh, happy, love their jobs, whatever it is. We all know those people. Also, some people are not meant to be thin. We're all shapes and sizes. Some people are meant to be bigger and heavier. There's something very interesting called the obesity paradox. Many people they found who are on the heavier side are actually super healthy. Their organs are in incredible shape, incredible heart, circulation's amazing, low cholesterol, all these things. So the first thing we really want to understand, there is no one perfect answer for weight. Um, and another issue that we really have to, along with these lines that I'm saying, there's a lot of pain and darkness around weight. So we really need to develop that compassion. When we look at why this is happening in the world, you know, there's a number of reasons. Um, and Again, I want you to, some of these things I say may be a little hard to get your head around, but just be open, okay? Obesity is not a personal issue. It's collective. We have this, is throughout the world. You are not the only person with a weight issue, okay? It's collective. It's shared. It personalizes in certain people, but it's not your fault. This is an important thing to get a hold of. It's not your fault. You can take responsibility, that's different, but it's not your fault. There are lots of mixed messages now in nutrition. There are lots of false promises made by doctors and nutritionists. The latest diet, you're gonna lose 50 pounds. You know, this supplement is gonna burn that fat away. But most of it doesn't work for the sustainable long term. Um, so that's a, an issue. Also, modern nutrition has sort of gone in one direction, which is punishment. Punishing heroic exercise, punishing the body into weight, you know, sort of, come on, you gotta lose it off, you gotta, you know, it's almost like a punishment, which again, doesn't work. If I said to you all, okay, you know what, just stop breathing. Come on, do it. Stop breathing. You'll all be like, oh, well, uh, right. well, maybe for a few minutes, but that wouldn't last. Telling people to stop eating is the same thing. You know, it doesn't work. So we have to have a different approach altogether. There is no perfect diet. There is no perfect weight. 
This is very important. You know, when that happens, when we think that, then we're almost setting ourselves up for failure and also going into once again, shaming on the self. I can't eat that perfect diet. Oh, I've blown it. Oh, you know, my weight, I can't get to that exact weight. There is no exact weight. So it's important to let go of some of these, what I call toxic beliefs. All of us from a young age have had it instilled into us about the idea of the perfect body that, you know, when you're little, the princess, she's gorgeous and slim and she marries the prince and it's all wonderful and happy. So it is something that has happened over the years that we've all kind of developed a sort of innate thought that, you know, if we're thin, life is going to be gorgeous. Um, I think you all know this, 98% of all diets do not work. Um, so we have to have a different approach. Jeanette, do you have any questions so far or are you okay? Because <laughs> she's mentioned <laughs> I have tons of questions. If you'd like to continue, that's great. Or if okay. you'd like me to jump in. Um, well, just, we, you know, I, I wrote what I did with Gannett. We wrote some questions, Jan, just so that um, we could sort of, you know, make sure to keep it on track and interesting. But it's a huge topic. So I'm trying to pick out things that, you know, we can have a little bit of a think about. Um, okay. Stress. Um, stress is a rabbit hole. It runs deep. It has far more implications on the body than we really thought in the past. Um, when we go into a stress state, and I'm sure many of you know this, then we have the sympathetic nervous system becomes dominant. So it switches on stress in the brain, but it switches off digestion, assimilation, calorie burning, metabolism goes off, appetite regulation is off. So when we're stressed, the body retains weight. This is very important to understand. So again, if, there's, if you're put under some stressful situation with your diet or, or exercise, you're actually going backwards because all the things when you're under stress, it's lining up for you to escape. It's not looking for pleasure or enjoyment, it's looking to escape. So all the important functions in the body slow down. Cortisol on the other hand goes up, thyroid hormone decreases. So when that happens, it t there tends to be fat starts to get stored around the body. Fat is is increased actually. So we need to really take a look at stress. Now, some people say, oh, I'm not stressed, you know, life's pretty good. But stress comes in all sorts, all kinds, and it can be a low level stress or obvious high level stress, you know. So low level stress could be something from way back that's just has created a stress situation in your body you may not be aware of but that actually slows down the whole system and can make you resistant to losing weight. Many times the issues with weight has nothing to do with the food. That's the symptom of the weight issue. Now, some people say, oh, Melanie, you're talking a load of rubbish. You know, what about all these diets and things like that? But many times if we ask people, how long have you been on a diet for? Some people have been trying to lose weight for 20 to 50 years. That's an awful long time to be focusing on something. It means it takes you away from your family, from intimacy, from a healthy relationship, from enjoying life, because the whole focus is on, I, I've got to lose more weight. Oh, no, I haven't got that. And then it comes back. Oh, no, I've got to do it again. So the whole focus alone is stressful. <laughs> We need to look at it differently and be willing to sort of take a little bit of a step into the unknown. Um, all of life is uncertain. We have to learn, if we can, to relax into uncertainty, to trust, trust our bodies, because there's a lot about control 
when it comes to trying to lose weight. Um, control is a kind of safety. People are very afraid if they aren't in control, they're just going to eat themselves to death. But there's, you know, ways to regulate the appetite that so that's not going to happen. Um, with stress comes deregulation of mood. Your sleep becomes impaired. Um, I'm just checking to our digestion. Healthy bacteria dies off. So stress is an important factor, and it's probably one of the key factors actually when it comes to weight. Um, a positive <laughs> weight equals potential energy. So again, when you start to see people on the street who are carrying more weight than in your judging mind thinks they have potential energy. This is scientific that fat is stored calories, but it's also unreleased energy. So this unreleased energy could be directed in many ways, could be directed towards creativity, could be directed towards some kind of transformative work, could be directed towards making more money, could be helping your sexual energy. This is just energy stored, almost like stuck, that just needs to be released. So when you feel empowered, then your metabolism is also empowered. So personal power equals metabolic power. They go together. So it's, you look at the person and you say, okay, they have energy to liberate. It's looking at it in a very different way, but very positive. Um, I want to talk a little bit, let me just, let me just have a quick look. Um, Okay, let's look at a little bit about healing. Um, when we, often people have this idea, not only with weight, but just in general, that they're broken. They need to be fixed. This is another toxic belief that we have to let go of. People are not broken. They don't need to be fixed. Often we can feel separated or disconnected from the whole. So oftentimes people feel disconnected from nature or a higher wisdom or a higher intelligence or any word you prefer to use. With this disconnection, it makes it more difficult because there's a sense of, and I don't, this might sound more, but meaningless, you know, what's the point type of thing. But we are not broken. You could have cancer and be whole. You know, some people have an emotional challenge, but are, you know, have amazing body. Some people are super caring, but maybe have some problem with their legs. We are, when, when we have a challenge, it's a challenge. It's a doorway to learning, a doorway to growing and developing and changing, but we're not broken we don't need to be fixed is that clear for everybody this is a hard one to to take on so again with some of these just be open and you know just look at it it's like looking in a different way you know um many people think health is absence of disease but health is really a journey we're all on a healthy journey hopefully moving towards health not away from it so when we look at health, it's not something you arrive at. It's a movement. And um, so we need to redefine that. We need to look at healing as well, because to heal is a form of love. It's self-love. It could be forgiveness. It could be seeing the bigger picture, you know, reclaiming your life, speaking your truth. All these things are forms of healing. It's not just having some problem and you're getting over it. It's looking at healing in a bigger sense, reconnecting to a bigger, greater reality, um, letting go of things that don't serve anymore. So there's, you know, relaxing into life. Along with stress is relaxation. In actual fact, as humans, we seek pleasure. We don't 
seek pain, we seek pleasure. And we want to make sure that in life we have pleasure. Um, when you're relaxed, which is the opposite of stress, is what's called parasympathetic nervous system dominance. Then your appetite can be regulated. You assimilate everything. You digest really well. You calorie burn really efficiently. Um, and you can build muscle and reduce fat. So that's why it's very important to learn ways to relax. It's easy for me to say, oh, just relax. But you know, you start just step by step, or you notice where, where is, you know, where do I get stress? You know, what things are causing me stress? Um, the other thing is to learn, and very importantly, to learn to love the self. Because if you're looking to lose weight, you need to love into love. You can't hate into love. You can't say, I hate this body and it's ghastly and it's, you know, I'm just going to do everything I can. And as soon as I've lost weight, I'm going to love it. It doesn't work like that. This is you now. The same thing with the fixed and broken. It's hard to um, love the self if you think you're broken. It's not empowering. When you think, you know, you're on, you have a challenge and you want to, uh, you know, work and learn from that challenge, it's different. Weight is a doorway to, to you know, health, growth, it, it's uh, education, um, to learn a lot about the self. Okay. Um, also, you know, along with... Um, the thing about being broken many times people think healing only happens in the body but that is not the case at all it can happen in the spirit the mind uh, in your emotions um, some people feel if they have a problem whether it's weight or a health issue that they have to be punished it's it, they're being punished for it which is just not the case at all so is everyone clear about what i'm saying along these things yeah any questions we were going to hold the questions because just in case at the end there are some. Um, okay. Exercise. Now, this is an interesting one. Again, in the modern, nu modern nutrition is um, industry based. It means that, you know, it's science for profit. Um, you can buy science, you can buy research. And that is also a big problem because, you know, there's so much out there. One diet is saying this is the best thing you'll ever do. Another diet, it's exactly the opposite, is telling you this is the best thing you'll ever do. So we have to, I'm not saying to throw science out the window. Of course not. It's very important. But it's like standing on one leg. One leg is science. But this other side is body wisdom, intuition, um, flowing, being open, letting go. So in some ways we could say one is more masculine, the other is more feminine. The more masculine approach of nutrition is numbers and heroic exercise and on the scale and you know how many kilos, pounds are you going to lose? That's more of the masculine approach. Feminine approach is being more open, allowing, letting go, movement, body wisdom, embodiment which is very important. So we need both. It's like standing on two legs. But the problem is for the last, I don't know, 60 years maybe, it's only been focused on the weight, the weight, the scales, watching your weight, you know, heroic exercise, you gotta, you know, um, eat less, exercise more, all these things, but they don't work. We know that, it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> Could be a few people, but about 98% it doesn't work. So we need to allow the other side to come in. Um, so with, with exercise, I look at it more as movement. How do you like to move? And the key is, do you love it? There's no point me telling you to go to the gym four times a week and spend an hour frantically on a, a treadmill. If you hate it, what good is that? One, it's gonna make you feel more stressed. So we're back on the stress thing. And number two, you're not going to do it for very long anyway. People can't do things they hate for very long. But movement is important. Humans are built to move. Um, we're built 
to be upright. If you imagine when you're a child or you have grandchildren or children, then he's struggling to walk and they're really struggling to be upright. We're built upright and we're meant to move most of the day, which, you know, in the modern world is not happening. But it's movement rather than exercise. So what you want to do is find something you love. Even if you start with five minutes a day, could be putting on music and dancing, could be, you know, going for a nice walk, it could be spiking or some yoga or some stretching, some kind of exercise that you love and you start slow and you build up. Because again, if you, if you go too gung-ho and you're not keen, it's not going to last. But many people find when they start slowly and build up that they actually really enjoy it. And also it's about how you feel. So, you know, it could be gardening, could be Tai Chi, could be cleaning. Some people love cleaning, <laughs> um, but it makes a big difference. The more we can move, the better it is for our health and weight. Um, okay. Now this, there are some things that we can do that are very simple, but they take practice. Often the simple things are the most challenging. Um, the, one of the best ways you can start on your journey to sustainable weight is to slow down, eat slowly. If I ask everybody, do you eat fast, medium or slow? The vast majority of people will say fast. You know, we're rushing out to work. Um, we're, you know, time in the office is short. And we only have a, you know, we eat at our desks really quickly. Some people just stand up to eat and they rush around. When you do this, it becomes stress. You're eating under stress. So back again to, you know, uh, low calorie burning, um, appetite, uh, dysregulation, um, not able to assimilate, not able to digest. When you're stressed, the body's not, the, you know, you're not thinking, hmm, I think I'll go buy that t-shirt that I, that I saw last week in the shop. No, when you're under stress, you're getting away from things as quickly as possible. You're not noticing anything. So when you eat quickly, it's also like, say, putting a, a video, you know, the, on, on, uh, on, on YouTube or something, or, or Facebook, people put videos and they put them really playing fast. And it's sort of funny, you know, people whizzing around, going backwards and up and down, whatever. But you can't then be asked for the details. Same as you're standing in a train station and a high speed train goes washing by, you can't recognize people's faces. You can't say, well, yeah, I remember that guy with the glasses and there was a lady with a hat. No, it's gone by. When you eat quickly, that's like the brain. The brain needs to scan to see what you've eaten. Has to scan through and see that you've had the right nutrients, that you've, you know, um, in, within the meal, there's enough there to sustain the body. If you eat quickly, the brain doesn't know that. So the end of the meal is hunger because there's no message. The, the brain hasn't had time. So it just signals more hunger. So the key is to slow down and eat slowly. Even if you're eating the best food on the planet, the healthiest food. Did you ask one question? You're on mute, I can't hear you. Gannett? No, I'm, no, I'm giving Sheldon directions of how he should live his life. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you were waving at me. So even if you're eating the best food on this planet, the healthiest food you could ever have, and you're eating it quickly, you've put yourself into a stress state and it's not gonna help you with weight. Um, also, within that, food should be pleasurable. Now, from birth, we're all hardwired to seek nourishment, which is, a higher level than nutrition, but I'm gonna say nourishment for many reasons. When you're a baby and you're born, you feel cold, you want food, you want to sleep, you, feel, you get, you know, you're hungry, you want to be nourished, you want, you know, whatever it is, that's what we're hardwired. We're hardwired to see 
or to seek food for emotional reasons, which there's nothing wrong with that. We're humans. You don't want to unemotionally eat food. You want to enjoy it. Food should be a pleasure. That's very important because many people see food as the enemy. Oh, this food is gas, you're gonna put weight on me and I'll eat it just really quickly. And you know, it's, it's gonna, it's the enemy. That's a toxic belief. Another one is, you know, my appetite is the enemy. I have a big appetite. Well, fantastic, direct it. Big appetite's wonderful. It's just about regulating it, but it's wonderful. Many people do turn to food for certain, you know, emotional um, issues, if we want to call them issues, or challenges. For example, you know, someone might overeat because they feel lonely. They may overeat because they would like a relationship. They may overeat because work's too intense or they don't have enough time. There's many reasons. That's comfort, comforting. Now, we can't just tell people, oh, stop that, because that's, what they're seek that's why they're seeking the comfort. They're seeking it because it's hardwired into us that food can you know, comfort us. You don't take that away from someone, that's their source of comfort. But what you can do is then look to see what's causing the desire for that and try to shift it a little bit. Um, so that's important. Now, with food, one of the big concerns um, about weight and food is quality. The quality of food today that is blasted out on the media, advertising, is some of the poorest quality food ever. And this food is also toxic and changes your brain chemistry. It makes you want more. So people see this on the news, they see and they watch it and they have it because it's there, it's brainwashing them and then they want more. So the portions get bigger, the amounts get bigger and we go back to there's not enough nutrients, good nutrients in that food, so the brain says hungry. So we need to look at that if, you know, aspect and understand one of the key things that you can do along with slowing down to eat, is to change the quality of your food, to really seek out the best quality you can possibly have. Local, fresh, straight from the fields, not processed in a factory. Even that alone will make a big difference. And going back to the meal, when we slow down to eat, it's not about chewing frantically. That is not the point. The part of eating is to be present and in the body, not chewing 50 times and counting. And, you know, that can be stressful and, and rather boring, to be honest. It should be enjoying the meal. I'm not saying chewing is not important. That's not it. But it's enjoying the meal sitting down, noticing the environment, make the environment beautiful. If you have a hard time, play some music, um, you know, look out the window, breathe, put the knife and fork or chopsticks or whatever down between each mouthful and just take a breath and count to five and let it go. Have a nice conversation with your partner if you're eating with someone and learning to enjoy the taste, really enjoy, relish it. You know, those, you know, the shapes of the Vegetables, notice that, the colors, the tastes. Um, all these things are really make a big difference. And it is difficult. There's no point me telling you, oh, you know, just slow down. It's a practice, like anything. Don't give up after three meals and say, oh, I can't do this, it's too tough. You just keep going, you try, you know. I. I don't win awards for slow eating and I've been working on this and it makes a big difference really. You feel much fuller much more quickly. If you want to regulate your appetite, that's a really good way to do it. And you just have to keep going. So we slow down the meal, we enjoy it. When you enjoy your meal, you're going into a relaxed state. When you're in a relaxed state, then you can absorb more, you assimilate more, you digest better, you calorie burn better you metabolize better. So we've got high quality foods, 
and let's just and slow eating two things that you can try with that comes substances coffee caffeine now i'm not against you know the dose makes the poison to be honest with you so i'm not saying those who love coffee get rid of it all it's a bit of a negotiation to be honest with any of these things but caffeine will put you into more of a stress state if you're having a lot you you don't have natural regulation if you're drinking 10 cups of coffee a day or having those energy drinks you know it does affect the body and the same with alcohol alcohol will put on weight now many people they want a glass or two of wine to relax so again i'm not suddenly becoming you know miss hardcore here saying give it all up but just observe just notice what you do it makes a difference um let me just see with food oh yes the other thing for some people now i just want you all to understand that weight has it's complex and there's different layers some people may be fine with one thing some people may have a problem with that do you see what i mean so not everybody has everything you know it's all it depends very much on the person um but allergies sensitivities in the body can make a difference the main ones are gluten um soy actually also dairy food and eggs so if you have along with you know problems losing weight then you have bloating and digestive issues it can also be from an allergy an allergen shall i say so you could try as an experiment just to you know cut one out for a while and see how you feel see if you feel better many times dairy allergies you know you may get some post nasal drip or you feel stuffy or a bit mucusy or you tend to you know feel a bit on the lungs that kind of thing you know often then there is some kind of either gluten or dairy you know allergy so it's important to have a look at that as well um everybody okay so far yeah okay um the other thing that so let's just recap things that you can do already work on the self-hate, the self-punishing, work on that, work on judging others who may have weight issues. Slow down to eat, enjoy the meal, enjoy it. And um, move, if you can, as you know, something you enjoy. Choose top quality foods and have a look at things like caffeine, how much you take, how much you use. Um, now another th interesting one now by the way you can try one of these things you could just say okay let me try eating slower you know you don't need to suddenly do everything because that can be a bit overwhelming but you can take one or two the two main ones i would do is eating slow and the quality of foods and then the others too of course but you know if you just wanted to pick one or two the other thing that's very important to look at is what we call the circadian rhythm with regards to nutrition. I don't know if you've heard of this. This is our sleep wake cycle. The body, we're, we're part of nature. We can't separate ourselves. Some humans want to, but we actually are. And you know, this is, this is the reality. We are no more or less important than a blade of grass in the natural world. We're all as important, but we're not any more important so the more we connected to nature the better it is and the sleep wake cycle is really understanding how humans follow the nature of the sun so in the morning when we wake up our metabolism starts to wake up at lunchtime, let's say between 11 and 1, our metabolism is at its most active. Then it starts to slow down and it's the most slow at 9 o'clock at night, more or less, let's say. 
So it stands to reason if you're going, if you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to skip the breakfast and the lunch and then start overeating in the afternoon and have a big dinner. Because what you've done is you've missed all the active metabolism bit and the metabolism is going, uh oh, we're starving, slow it down even more. So then by the time that you get to having your snack in the afternoon or you, you know, eat, eating a packet of biscuits then, and then at night you have a big dinner, you're eating at the slowest metabolizing time, the slowest calorie burning time. So it's very important to understand if you're trying to lose weight, breakfast is important. Now, if you imagine your metabolism is like a little fire, in the morning, you're beginning to stoke that fire. Well, you need something to make the fire light, otherwise it's not gonna light. So you have something for breakfast. Now, if you ate too much at that time, it would probably overwhelm the fire and put it out. You know, if you pile too many logs on at once, it's not gonna light well. So you don't want to overdo it, obviously, but you want to have something um, nutritious and energizing at breakfast. Then lunch around, up to about one o'clock is the best time to burn calories. So that would be, if you're going to have a meal, a larger meal, it would be then. In the evening, a smaller meal. Walking after each meal, even just a nice stroll for 10 minutes can make a big difference. It can really help with, the, with calorie burning and metabolism. Just to, you know, it doesn't have to be some frantic um, power walk, just, just a nice walk. That helps too. Um, so that's very important. And then, I'm sorry if I'm giving you all this information. I hope that I can go through it again, just to remind you. Um, we want to have a look at our macronutrients. I don't know if everyone knows what these are. This is our protein, fat, and carbohydrate balance. Because many people today, they're eating a high refined carb diet. Maybe some Cheerios at breakfast or a bagel or a muffin here or there. And they've got to dinner and they haven't had any really good protein. And they, you know, there's a toxic belief that fat, dietary fat will make you fat. That is not true. We need good quality fat. Again, if the body doesn't get it, it's gonna slow the metabolism down and you're gonna have more trouble, more weight resistance. You need good quality fat. So you want to have a quick look over your diet. How much carbs are you having? Are they good quality? Are they whole grains or are they refined carbs? What kind of protein are you having? Um, again, this wonderful vegetable quality proteins. And I know if you're in, I know many from Israel, you've got some lovely things you can have there. So hummus for breakfast, you can use all kinds of beans. You can have a little experiment with tofu, see if you like it. Some of the whole grains have protein like quinoa, quinoa, buckwheat. So there's lots of things you can do and you can be a little bit experiment with it. With the quality, good quality fats, there's the chia seeds and the flax seeds and you can have nut butters, um, uh, little avocados, you know, there's things you can have. And it's not to be afraid. That's a toxic belief about the fat. Nutritional fat's going to make me fat. It doesn't. Okay. So that's one to, to throw out the window. But it does, even if you tweak a little bit your protein, carbohydrates, and fats, you can see a difference actually. So that could be if you know that you eat tons of whole grains and very little of the other, you might need to shift it. You may need to change it. If you eat a lot of refined carbs, you may need to obviously change to whole grains, but not too much because you may have become resistant. The problem with, you know, refined carbs, it makes your in, you more insulin resistant. We need the fiber because the fiber helps to balance um, your sugar levels. Also, of course, when we use more fresh foods, quality foods, they're what we call anti-inflammatory. So it's a sideline and very important for the body. So, you know, that's a nice win-win. Um, okay, let me see. So we got the breakfast. So that's pretty much it. I can obviously go into more 
um, more detail about anything. But if you have questions now, if you'd like to ask any questions, does anyone have anything? Nothing? <laughs> I have a couple questions. Okay. I'd like to know about the belief that, oh, this isn't good for me. Oh, it very like good. That's a yeah, oh, pushing brilliant. against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, brilliant. Okay. What we need to understand about food, and it's a good question because when you think some food is bad or you have some moralism around food, it makes it much more difficult to have sustainable weight. Because if we look at food, there is no good or bad food. Food is just food. It's just things put together. The food itself, there's no good or bad. But it's what we do with it. So again, it's the, you know, dose makes the poison, of course. But if you can let go of that moralism, it makes a big difference to how you, you know, approach your food. Because oftentimes when we think a food is bad and then we eat it, we feel very guilty and we feel a lot of shame about it. And it's almost like a fight happens with the food. I mean, I, bet, I don't know about everybody, but I, uh, you know, it's just for example, if I hadn't had peanut butter for a while and I think to myself, oh, I haven't had peanut butter for a while. You can bet the next day I'm having peanut butter. You know, it's something about our minds. So the more you can let go of judgment around food, I'm not saying all food's great and you can just eat whatever you want. But it's to understand it's not good or bad. It's how we think about it. And also, like I said, the dose makes the poison. So when we look at diets, for example, in the past, diet or dieta meant way of life. It didn't mean what we think of as diet. But um, when we look at diets, we could look at different things. We can look at a sustainable diet, which is one that we want to have day, you know, on a daily basis. What you eat on a weekend is not going to have nearly the same effect as what you eat day in, day out. What you have once a year at a special holiday is definitely not going to have the same effect. So the sustainable diet is one. If you're trying to improve something, a challenge, a condition, you could do a therapeutic diet, but that's more for a short while. You know, some people, they get into the therapeutic diets and just continue it for, the, for years sometimes. You know, we all change. We have to look, even, you know, and you know this, we can change with the season, seasonal foods come and go, but we all change. As we get older, we might change. We might have different needs. So it's important to be flexible and understand that the key is the sustainable daily diet. But we could experiment sometimes, just like I said, maybe you want to try no gluten for a month. It's an experiment. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's again, that trusting learning to relax into uncertainty and to trust you know and trust the body wisdom the more you do that the more you listen to your body the more you're going to get the messages um so it is important to look and see you know what what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and to try to drop the good bad because really in all honesty what may be great for you may not work for me so well i do always encourage quality i think that makes the huge difference the quality and on that note something i didn't cover yet which is very important is the idea of embodiment being in the body um people may not understand this but when you're stressed what happens is you actually go out of body you know some of those cartoons and they have the little thing around here and it says wow or something in it it's almost like you're living in that cartoon bubble you're out of body when you're out of body it feels very unstable and you're not able to lose the weight easily so learning to embody is very important so the slowing down to eat is a way to embody more enjoying things is a way to embody more dancing listening to music anything that engages the senses being in the kitchen cooking all that helps you to embody when you embody then you can be aware 
of your body. Many times people who want to lose weight, they disengage from it, they separate. But you can't lose something you don't have. So if I said to Gannett, you know, Gannett, I want you to lose that $100 bill. If she doesn't have a $100 bill, how can she lose it? If you're not really in your body and acknowledging what weight you have, you can't lose it really. It's difficult. The other thing is to notice where in life you may feel heavy because weight is like light, lightening up, isn't it? When you lose weight, you're lighter. Many times people say, oh, I feel so much lighter now. But the heaviness can be somewhere else, could be in your job, could be your relationship with your children, could be your, you know, you're not using your creativity. Any of these things can create a heaviness, not expressing how you feel, not forgiving from the past. When you forgive, it doesn't mean that you approve, but it means you can forgive. It's very, very lightening for people. So that's also something to look at. What parts of life do I feel heavy? Because that's about weight is being heavy too. So learning to embody is very important. Even walking barefoot outdoors, it's fantastic for that. Two more questions. All right. One, someone asks, what if you're not hungry at breakfast? And can you um, use, do we, I'll just, the rest, do we three meals a day? And what about snacking between meals? So that's all one question about hunger and how many meals and snacking. And okay. the other question, the question is about obesity in children. Okay. So the thing about the rhythm, obviously, yes, yeah, some people, they're not hungry when they first wake up. So what I would suggest is to do something first, maybe have a nice tea and then, you know, maybe in an hour have something. Um, ideally, it's three meals a day. Snacks, if you have snacks, really a healthy snack and it shouldn't replace the meal. Some people who have blood sugar issues need to have those two small snacks in between. Um, if you can go without that, that's fine too. But um, about yeah, three meals a day, now, there's a big thing about the intermittent fasting. I've noticed men do better with that for some reason than women. But just be careful with it because it can make you more weight resistant. A couple of things along with that, because I'm just thinking about it, is that you might want to also <clears throat> get a blood test just because Many people today have thyroid issues, sluggish thyroid, and that really makes it difficult to lose weight. Also, pre-diabetes or insulin resistant or diabetes is another um, health challenge that can help, can make it more resistant for weight. Medications too, um, antidepressants, very, make it very difficult to lose weight. Also steroids, of course. So any of these things, we just, it doesn't mean it's impossible or, you know, oh, that's a disaster. It's just to acknowledge that and to be aware of it. And the question about children, again, this is not pointing a finger. If a child has a problem with weight, we have to talk to the parents. We have to look to the parents because the child is following the parents. Children are extremely observant but they aren't good at interpreting. So it doesn't mean the parents might be trying really hard with the food, but if there's some stress in the house, it could be that. Could be some stress at school, you know. So it's important to talk to the parents first about it or to, you know, really have a look to see if there's, you know, was there a divorce or did a grandparent pass away or something that could be causing stress to that child. And of course, the diet, you know, to make sure that the diet is healthy for the child, because that will make a big difference. Um, one of the researchers say that between the ages of zero and 21 is when we develop our fat cells. So if you have trouble with weight during that time, it can be a bit more challenging to lose weight later on. Okay, but it, again, it doesn't mean any of these things, it doesn't mean it's impossible, you know, or hopeless. We all have different um, 
different challenges and weight, there's many layers and many different ones. So everybody is unique, everyone is different. And skipping breakfast altogether, fasting in the morning, what do you think? I think that's not a good idea personally because that's when your metabolism is waking up. So I would suggest that thing like if you have a hard time, uh, I don't like to eat when I get up immediately. I usually hike with my dogs first and then I have something. So, you know, even if you can have something in that, uh, in the morning time up until about even let's, you know, up until about two is when your metabolism is the most active. Now, if you're really happy, you're happy with your weight and your energy is great and you feel great and breakfast is not your thing. Well, we're not going to fix something that's not broken. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's just if you're trying to lose weight or, you know, yeah. Any, anything else anybody has questions? Wow, I do. No, and it was great. Yeah, I do have a blog. Um, it's M, uh, Melanie Waxman at blogspot.com. And if anyone was interested in a session you can let Gannette know and she can let me know because I can do on you know online sessions with people. Um, but Melody, um, for someone who's in their mid to late 70s and is very active and of there is there still the same need for the same consumption of calories or can they get by like you say three meals a day Mm. I'm having a particular hard time having even two meals a day at six o'clock. I, I, I have no appetite. I just put the plate in front of me and I fill it up a small plate and I try to fill it, eat it. it. I'm not really enjoying it. Do you have any, I, pro do you have a problem with weight at all? No, I don't. I'm very thin. Uh, so and I'm, I'm very active and I have a lot of energy, but I eat a lot of, I eat a lot of 11 to 12 until two o'clock and then that's it. I'm, my appetite is nothing after that. It's very hard. Yeah. I think that's okay. What I would suggest is maybe if you could just have something small at night just to keep, you know, cause you don't want to get too uh, thin. Rice, rice cakes and some uh, protein. Rice or, you know, a, a little veg or, yeah, you could have that with some, you know, vary it. You could have that with a little protein. Vary it, yeah. You know, um, some, so a little bit of veggies if you can because but i I'm, exercise early in the morning so i really need to have something at six o'clock i don't yeah, no, i don't eat before i exercise no that's excellent if you if you're yeah yeah perfect and you're exercising and then having a nice lunch but then i would make sure you have something in the evening okay and you don't want to get no. too thin so you know soy, soy yogurt soy yogurt yeah you could have that i mean you know some berries it depends on you know, some people have a big thing about fruit at night, but some people are fine with fruit at night. So you just have to find what works for you. Um, you know, because I, I, I personally can have fruit at night. I have no problem with it. I can eat raw salad at night, no problem. But some people, they're sensitive and they have a hard time. So again, we have to learn our own body, our own body wisdom, what works for us. But, you, you know, at your age, you still want to make sure that you have enough good nutrients so you know make sure you're drinking enough Pe peanut butter peanut butter 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 yeah that's good you can have peanut butter yes yeah okay yeah and um, just to you know with weight if you're slim or too thin it has a similar effect you want to have you know make sure you're having regular meals as well okay yeah <laughs> okay all right <laughs> Anyone else? All have right, a... Melanie. I think, I... Um, and I, I'll answer, Gretchen. Just, I was just going to say, just to remember, we all have a story, and our story has brought us to the very point we're all sitting here today, mm -hmm. and that story is important. So we want to have a look at it, not with shame or, or you know regret, but more just to say, you know, history. That's a story. That's what that is what it means. It's history. So just. Um, Everybody is on their journey. It's more difficult when we have loved ones, when their journey is not how we would like it to be. So it is more of a challenge. But what you can do is just to be grateful before your meal. You know, thank you for this wonderful food that I'm so fortunate to have. You know, thank the farmers or, you know, thank 
you're, that you have a lovely family, whatever it is in your head, you don't have to do it out, you know, in your mind. That actually helps us to feel more relaxed. Um, but just sitting- And Melanie, thank you for a wonderful talk. Okay, so <laughs> she's telling us to go. All right, it was nice to meet everybody. It's Bye. wonderful, Melanie, it's such a pleasure. Do you send me this tape? <laughs> yes. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Good to see you, Melanie. Um,